If you have your Bible with you, we are in Romans chapter 3. We've been going verse by verse through the book of Romans together. So if this is your first Sunday with us, uh, we spent six weeks uh, looking at chapter 1. And then last week we looked at all of chapter 2. And and really all of this has been around uh, these verses that these are our memory verses for this first section. And we will be here next week. So we've been building to this. Would you say it with me, Romans 3, 22 through 24. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That is the good news. The good news is this free justification by grace. But in order for us to get there, Paul has been really camping out uh, back in verse 23, right? And so for the last eight weeks, we've been looking at really for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And uh, we started with what sin looks like. And last week, uh, we looked at this idea of for all. Uh, We've looked at just how sin affects the world and Man, what a, what a week this has been around here. If we needed, we don't need, but when sin runs rampant in a society, we have devastating things that happen. And I, I've been thinking all week, like, what do we say in light of of this situation in our community. And I think this is where I've landed. I think that if we would have known about that situation before it happened, and I got up here on a Sunday morning and said, there's a little girl who's in desperate need of a safe place to live. I think if I said that before it happened, right now in this service, there'd be 50 families that would say, she can come live with me. I believe that. And in this situation, everybody says, I just want to do something. I just want to do something. I want to challenge you today that there are 50 more just like her in this county. 50 is probably a gross underestimate. Uh, The school district guesses hundreds. I met with a guy this week who runs the Texas Baptist Home for Children that it's really a bad name because um, back in the day, we had a home for children and it was basically kind of a foster orphanage, right? Well, the state of Texas doesn't let you do that anymore. And so really the Texas Baptist Home for Children, their goal is to find foster families for these children because they can't put them all in one place anymore because of the rules. And so he and I had breakfast at Pitt Row on Tuesday and we talked about Polk County and The last statistic was that in Polk County alone, there were 24 kids in need of foster placement. And there was one that was placed in Polk County because that was all that's available. 23 kids are sent, they've been sent all over the state. Those are just the ones that have been placed. He told me, and you're not gonna believe this, and I don't believe it either. He said that right now there's such a shortage of homes for kids that the state is not pulling kids for what is called general abuse or uh, general sexual abuse. That the only way a kid gets pulled out of a house is if the abuse is beyond general. And my question to him was the same one he had back to me. What does that even mean? Guys, I don't have an answer this morning. I don't. But I think it's time we start asking the question, what is the church of Jesus Christ going to do in this county? And last week, I referenced a Barna study that said only 15% of non-believers had ever met a Christian that seemed any different than them. If we're gonna change that number, I think it starts here. 
And you're gonna hear me over the next few weeks and especially after Easter, we're gonna talk about what does this look like? I don't even know. But if we really wanna do something, let's do something. Let's do something. So would you join me in praying that God will show us what that next step is and how we're each gonna be involved in it? And I'm tired of seeing kids who have to suffer because of the evils of this world. And that's where we are this morning in chapter three. It's not a fun passage. I mean, really, (laughs) what's been fun so far? Uh, We've talked about how terrible the world is. And then last week we talked about how we are also responsible for how terrible the world is. And Now we get to this section of scripture, like the good news starts next week. But we get to this section of scripture and I was studying, I've I've never preached on a lot of this stuff. I'd never preached anything from Romans chapter two. I've never preached this section of Romans chapter three. Everybody loves the end. I, I can't wait for next week. And I sat down to study and the very first thing I read was a joke by John, uh, not a joke, a, a quote by John Piper. He's this famous preacher, famous author. And he said about this passage, he said, this passage makes my brain explode. That was encouraging. He's like trying to understand what Paul is doing here in these 20 verses and understand the complexity of this paragraph almost broke his brain. And what we're going to see here, again, the arc is we're building to our memory verses, 22, 23, 24. So the arc has been, Paul starts with the early church and he explains the problem of sin so that they fully understand their need for that justified freely by his grace. And after last week, if you were an early church member, an early church, uh, a Jewish convert, and you read chapter two, you might be a little mad. What do you mean you're calling me out, Paul? I'm not, it's not my fault. And so what happens here in these next 20 verses is Paul has a imaginary conversation with the people who are probably objecting to what he just said. So you're gonna get a lot of rhetorical questions here. So we're, we're kind of looking at this like Paul is saying, Look, here is the charge against you. Here's the evidence. And then here's the verdict. And then next week we get the good news that the sentence doesn't have to be what we deserve. Romans 3, 1 says, says, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? And remember last week we talked about that Jew in the modern context in this passage could also refer to the church, okay? I mean, that's the audience that he's writing to. And so after he says, like where we ended last week, church, you're responsible because you're not any different than the world. He says, so why do we even do this? Why do we even come to church? Why get baptized? Why study our Bible? Why pray? Is there any advantage if we're gonna be just like the rest of the world? He says, much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. So he says, yeah, there is an advantage to being a part of this because we've been given God's word. We have a direct connection to the absolute truth of God's word, which which encourages us individually. It reveals the nature of God. It helps us understand our need. It is a light in the darkness. And he says, from the beginning of time, God reached out to his people through his word. And so the advantage we have then is that we can know the heart of God. And by understanding God's heart, we can begin to understand our own. And so he says to that church, you have the word of God. And so they might say back, well, if God is faithful and his word is true and he made all these promises that he's gonna protect us and that we are his people and all of these things, well, then what, can I do something that 
nullifies the promises of God? Because again, this is a primarily Jewish audience and they had been studying from when they were little bitty, the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And they had heard, you are a chosen people. You're a chosen people. And so their response might be, well, look, let's put it in modern terms. I grew up in church. I've been a part of this my whole life. You're telling me that what I have done nullifies God's promise? I was visiting with someone this week and we were talking about just some hard things in life. And, you know, there's so much that we read in the Bible. And we're like, but, but it says this and then this happens. But it says this and then this happens. It's the same question. Are we so sinful that God isn't true to his promise? Will our unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? We need to remember that when God makes a promise in the Old Testament, he doesn't make it to a person. He makes it to a people. And that's through Abraham. But that promise here, he says, seek the Lord where it may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. That was a promise to a people group. And sometimes we think, well, I can get in the way of what God is doing by no means. Verse four, my clicker is being sluggish. Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. He said, can I get in the way of God's promise? Not at all. Of course not. Because it's written that you may be proved right when you speak, you God, and prevail when you judge. Now, He's quoting, he's going to quote a lot of Old Testament here. But he's quoting David in Psalm 51, who was confessing his sin before God. And basically what he's saying is, look, no matter what I do, you're right. There is nothing that I can do, even in my sinfulness, that changes that you are right in your verdict and you are justified when you judge. Verse 5. Verse five, but if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust and bringing his wrath on us? And he says, I'm, I'm using a human argument. So basically he's, he's trying to overcome their objections here, right? So it's like, well, can I nullify God's promise? Well, of course not. But does that mean that God isn't just? Because if my wickedness makes God look better, then why am I being punished for making him look good? His holiness is perfect and my sinfulness shows God's goodness. So why would he punish me for that? Certainly not. It, we get several responses to his questions here. That, that one really should be translated foolishness. Foolishness. If that were so, how could God judge the world? We learn, some would argue if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? If all I'm doing is showing how good God is, then why does he have a problem with it? Genesis eighteen twenty five. Abraham's talking to God about the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all earth do right? Psalm 9, 8, he rules the world in righteousness, judges the people with equity. Verse eight, why not say, this is the conclusion of the foolish argument. Why not say, as some as slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. What shall we conclude then? So this idea here is basically, and we're gonna really dig into this later in Romans because this was a big deal in the early church. Basically people were saying, well, I should just keep on sinning because the more I sin, the more God forgives. And the more God forgives, the better he is. 
and the more people see how good he is. And so really, my sin just helps the process. Is it a, it's amazing what mental gymnastics we will go through to justify just wanting to do what we want to do. And so Paul is basically like, I know you're mental gymnastics. Let me just tell you what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, my sin just makes God better. Absolutely not. By no means. And then we get to verse nine. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. Now, this is where when you're reading it, you can start going, okay, this is where your brain breaks. Because verse one, he says, do we have any advantage? Of course we do. And then we get to verse nine, he says, do we have any advantage? Not at all. So which one is it? Do we have an advantage or not? I'm, I'm doing a Bible in a year. I don't normally, like, I don't normally do it, but I, I'm, I'm doing it, just felt led to. And sometimes I get to sections that are my day and I'm reading it and I'm like, I have no idea what this means. And why is this even here? Right? Like I'm reading Job right now because it's in my Bible in a year. And I have to like hold my hands like this to focus on the screen so I don't get distracted and start thinking about baseball. Because I'm like, what does this even mean? And so we, we can, this is, this is so beautiful what he's writing here. And it leads to some of the most inspiring words in all of scripture. And he's not contradicting himself. What he's saying is, shall we conclude that we somehow have an advantage that makes us exempt from God's wrath? Not at all, by no means. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. So this is kind of where he summarizes the argument before he gives the good news. This is the indictment. Paul says, in the first three chapters to this point, I am making the charge that all of us alike are under the power of sin. When we define what sin is, usually we say it, it's missing the mark. It's missing the mark of God's holiness. And that is truthful. It's a really good, simple explanation. But it is so easy to speak Christianese and be like, oh, I'm just missing the mark right? Like if I were shooting an arrow at a bullseye and I didn't hit the bullseye, but I, let's say I got an eight instead. Oh, I missed the mark. I mean, that's close, but I missed the mark. This is the definition of sin that I read this week. It is a rebellion against God's sovereign authority, a despising of his word in person, a defiance of God himself. That sounds a lot more serious than missing the mark. Augustine said, sin comes when we take a perfectly natural desire or longing or ambition and desperately try to fulfill it without God. It is a perverse distortion of the image of the creator in us. When we say all of us have sinned, we don't go, oops. It is a challenge to God's rebellion against God's sovereign authority. That's the charge against us. And then he gets to verse 10. And verse 10 is one of those sections of scripture that we don't have all the information for because the original audience would know that he was quoting the Old Testament. And so they would know all the stuff that comes around it. Okay. So what I want to do this morning is I want to read it and we're going to go back and I'm going to show you where it comes from in the Old Testament. This passage, uh, this little section of scripture has been called by theologians, 14 horrible things about us all. Isn't that great? I have yet to find someone with a t-shirt or a coffee mug with these verses on them. Right? Nobody's like, guess what I memorized this week? 14 horrible things about us all. But they're truthful. Verse 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. Who understands. 
There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away and they've become together worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So when the original reader was reading verse 10, 11, and 12, no one righteous, not even one, no one who seeks God, all have turned away, they would have remembered that this came from Psalm 14. And the greater context is the fool in his heart said there is no God, right? So he's quoting snippets of things that they would have understood the greater context. So when he says, all of us are under the power of sin, he jumps to this idea of the fool in his heart says there is no God, the rebellion against God. And there's the, they're corrupt, their deeds are vile. There's no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. And all have turned away and become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. So the greater context there is, God looks down from heaven just to see if there's anyone who would trust him. Verse 13, that comes from Psalm 5, 9 and Psalm 140. 5, 9 says not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Psalm 140 says their tongues are as sharp as serpents and the poison of viper is on their lips. Verse 14 their mouth are full and cursing and bitterness. That comes from Psalm 10, 7. And so again, we're getting a greater context. Verse 15 about shedding blood and misery and ruin and the way of peace they do not know. That comes from Isaiah 59. Their feet rush into sin. What a great description of humanity. The way of peace they do not know. There's no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads No one who walks along them will know peace. And verse 18 comes from Psalm 36. A message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. So he says, the indictment is we rebel against God. The evidence is ample that we do these things. And then here is the verdict, verse 19. Verse 19. Now we know that whether the, whatever the law says, it says that those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Now, this word is really interesting. In the Greek, usually when Paul writes and says, we know something or we're know, knowing something, he uses a word, gnosko, starts with a G-N, gnosko. And gnosko is a knowledge that we learn over time. But that is not the word he chose to use here. As I've told you before, some, like we get the Greek word, or we get the English word knowledge, but there might be five, I don't know how many there are, but several Greek words that mean a different kind of knowledge. And the word that he uses here is Ido, E-I-D-O. And it is the fullness of knowledge that has already been revealed and doesn't need to be understood because it's already complete. So now we have the complete knowledge of God's truth so that we'll quit talking back and we'll understand our situation. When he says their mouths be silenced, basically what he's saying is, understand that we're without excuse. We don't have to be taught to make excuses. We don't have to be taught to shift blame. Go volunteer in the nursery and come back and report to me. Right? And never in my life that I sit down with any of my kids and say, I'd like to teach you how to shift blame. I'd like to teach you how to say somebody else is responsible. 
But it, it, as young as two, they, I didn't do it. You're standing there holding the crayon. There's red marks on the wall. You're, you're literally caught red-handed. I didn't do it. I don't know how I got there. It doesn't go away. I got a junior high boy right now. You won't ever find a creature that never does anything wrong. It's a junior high boy. <laughs> but where is he learning that? Where do they learn that? They learn it from adults who don't accept responsibility for their own actions. And Paul says, when you really understand the depth of our sin, the only response is silence. Because I have no words to make it better. And I'm accountable for it. Therefore, big therefore. This is the summary of the first three chapters. So this is a summary of eight weeks that we've done together. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, rather through the law, we become conscious of our sin. The law is God's way of showing us the straight path which reveals how crooked we really are. And I, I read something this week. I'd never seen this before in scripture or this passage. But think back to Adam and Eve. They mess up, right? God says, don't eat the tree. Or don't eat of the tree. Don't actually don't eat the tree either. But don't eat the fruit of the tree. And then they eat the fruit of the tree. And what do they immediately do? They try something to cover it up. They make clothes and they hide. And then God says, did you eat of the tree? And what does Adam say? She told me to. And he goes, well, he told me to. Works and excuses have been the response of sin from the beginning of man. I'd never, ever seen that before. From the very beginning of sin, we've tried to cover our tracks and work our way out of it. And the bad news is there is nothing that you can do to overcome this sin. And the good news is there's nothing that you can do to overcome this sin. And next week, oh, next week we get to take a deep breath. I mean, goodness gracious, we've been in God's wrath and sin and the downfall of society now for eight weeks. And next week we get to celebrate grace and mercy and freedom. But we can't celebrate grace and mercy until we fully understand our need for for it. If this is where the story ends, we've been accused, the evidence has been presented, and we stand convicted. The only thing left is the sentencing. And that's where the good news comes in. It's in a fun like when we go verse by verse through a book of the Bible, some weeks we leave going on. Oh. But boy, next week's coming. So your takeaway from all of this, besides that Paul likes to have hypothetical arguments with nobody. Man, the depth of my sin, which only amplifies the grace of, of Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning, this is your first time and you're like, ugh, that is not what I wanted to hear. Please come back next week. Because next week, what he gets to tell us is, even though you deserve death and separation, God made a way that you don't have to suffer under the weight of this anymore. It's what we got to celebrate this morning. 
next week is the best news ever. But to really understand how good it is, we got to understand how bad the situation is. 